come now to one of the rarer delights to be found in our study of English literature. Hamlet's soliloquy as envisioned by Shakespeare. Denham, read. <clears throat> ham, to be or not to be. Denham, the word ham is not to be read, neither as part of the soliloquy nor as a self-condemnation of your own performance. It is an abbreviation of Hamlet, the character who is speaking. Again. Yes, sir. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the stings, uh, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing in them to die, uh, and them, to die... Enough. Ladies and gentlemen, I identified Hamlet's soliloquy as one of the rarer delights to be found in our study of English literature. I cannot permit you to leave this classroom with Denham's unthinking desecration echoing in your ears. I shall attempt to convey to you the torment that existed in Hamlet's mind when he said, to be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. <laughs> Old Ironheart, we salute you. May your luncheon remain forever in your throat. <laughs> <laughs> Still boning for that thesis on Greek legend? Mm. I think I'll challenge the existence of Homer as an individual. What will be your contention? No one man could write that much trash. Aren't you being a bit rough on the poor fellow? No more than you would be, Dan. Several people have mentioned lately that you're becoming a sort of Professor Sayer Jr. I'm delighted to hear that. Are you, actually? Soon you'll be teaching, and it's a very unusual person who can be happy as a teacher. Well, you can't deny we're peculiar. Oh, uh, your digestive pills. Oh, oh. Yes, thanks. Hello? Yes? Who shall I say is calling? It's for you, Miss Carroll, Mimi. Why is she calling me? I never heard even nod to me. Hello? Carol? The girls have asked me to invite you to the Try You house tonight for something very important. I'm sorry, but I'm working on a thesis. What's it all about? All I can tell you is that there is something very special we have to show you. And you must be here by 8 o'clock. That's all I can tell you, except it'll be a night you'll never forget. Fine. Remember, no later than eight. Bye. I'll get it, Mr. Walker. Carol, I'm so glad you could come. Why did you want me? You'll see. Hi, Carol. Hi, Anne. Now, we've been waiting for you. Here you are, front and center, our guest of honor. Is this your idea of a joke? Having me drop work and walk halfway across town to watch this, this idiot's delight? It's no joke. This is something the whole campus is arguing about, and you're here to settle that argument once and for all. Hey, Hank, turn on the set. Why all the mystery? You'll see, you'll see. Now, settle down, everybody. Prune nectar, prune nectar. What you need is prune nectar. The luscious royal nectar of the prune. Just savor the flavor. You'll do yourself a favor. If you drink prune nectar morning, night, and noon. It's fortified, it's fortified with vitamins, vitamins to give you energy. energy. It's guaranteed to magnetize your personality. Prune nectar, prune nectar. What you need is prune nectar. Delicious royal nectar of the prune. Skull! If you want to be a regular guy, better get prune nectar soon. Hello, I'm Gloria Marlowe.
the one you're about to see opposite Bruce Blair? Just think, our pictures were made more than 20 years ago, and their stories are still as romantic and timeless as these exotic perfumes here before me. Our secret, my five sins, double passion. Well, more about the product later. Tonight, I give you Bruce Blair, the original dream oh, boat in the, in the Return of El Toro. Quiet, quiet. you want? No, you're mistaken. There's no dreamboat here. You must have a wrong number. Hello. Double passion. No, I don't have any for sale. I don't even know what it is. What do you mean, our secret? Who is this? Hello. Hello. Carol? Carol, open the door. Go away, you dreamboat. Dreamboat? Open this door. Open it immediately. Carol, you're behaving like an hysterical child. Now, if something is wrong, let's discuss it calmly and intelligently. If something is wrong. I, your own daughter, have to find out your horrible secret from almost total strangers. My, my horrible secret. You know what I'm talking about. You, you, Bruce Blair. Oh. So you know. How did you find out? You were on television tonight, at the Try You house. Television? That's impossible. I've been here all evening. It doesn't matter where you are. It's your past I'm talking about. They were showing an old movie. No. Yes. The room was jammed with idiots howling at the shameful way you were making love to Gloria Marlowe. It was ghastly. This is vicious. Those pictures were made before you were born. It's like exhuming a man from his grave. Oh, Dad, why didn't you tell me? Because I chose to forget that I'd ever been in Hollywood. 
After all, it's not like a criminal trying to conceal his record. But imagine the shock to me. Here I'd always thought of you as a dignified, intellectual person. I've done everything I can to be like you. And then, all at once, to find out the truth. But you don't know the truth. I was a teacher before I became an actor, the same as I am now. The Hollywood interval happened when I... when I met Gloria Marlowe. Were you married to Mother then? Of course not. Anyway, against my better judgment, I consented to be Miss Marlowe's leading man. Were you in love with her? The only woman I ever loved from the day I met her till the day she died was your mother. I'm sorry, dear. But how can we face people now that they know that Gloria Marlowe called you Dreamwoat? So that's the reason for those calls. She's advertising perfumes with terrible names like Double Passion and My Five Sins. Five? The way the kids made fun of you. We'll never live this down, never. My dear, I admit this is shocking news to me, but it's only momentary. All right. For a day or so, the students will make their asinine little jokes about Bruce Blair, and then they'll forget it. Do you think so? I know so. You make it seem so simple. That's only one of the duties of a competent father. Good night, my dear. Good night, dear. Bruce Blair. Dream. We don't want to be narrow-minded about your sudden uh, <laughs> notoriety. Uh, uh, but naturally, we must preserve the dignity of the school. I understand, Doctor. The students are a bit out of hand at the moment, but I'm sure they'll settle down. Not as long as you're appearing on their television screens as Bruce Blair, the dreamboat. Ladies and gentlemen, inasmuch as spring vacation starts tomorrow, I'll be able to go to New York and secure an injunction against the televising of these films. Do you expect the television industry to assume responsibility for your past indiscretions? Mr. Sayre, if you should decide to submit your resignation, we shall accept it. Reluctantly, of course. I have no intention of resigning. I have been completely happy in my work, devoted to the ideals of education, and, well, I, I guess some of the ivy on these walls has attached itself to me. Would the board choose to reach a decision now, or would it prefer to receive my considered recommendation at a later date? I think we should leave it up to you, Matilda. In that case, I think we may consider the meeting adjourned. Please wait in my office, Mr. Sayer. Yes, sir. Well, this is an unpleasant mess, Mr. Sayer. You're putting it mildly, Doctor. It's quite a decision I must make. I realize how importantly this may affect your future as a teacher. This is the only work that means anything to me. Any consideration you give will be deeply appreciated. I wonder. You know, Thornton, I've liked you ever since you first came here. I've liked you very much. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I've admired you, too. You're a very brilliant person. Has it never occurred to you that I'm also a woman? Yes. Right now, as a matter of fact. I'll tell you a secret, Thornton. Uh, many years ago, I was a devoted fan of Bruce Blair's. I hated Gloria Marlowe every time he took her in his arms. I adored his handsomeness, his devil-may-care attitude, his wickedness. And when you came here, I never actually realized who you were, except I felt a strange attraction to you, the same as I'd felt for Bruce Blair. And now, finally, I know why. Uh, doctor, uh, get hold of yourself. Uh, uh, you rang for me, Doctor? Uh, yes, the doctor rang. Uh, I had a fainting spell. Would you bring me some water, please? Oh, of course. As I said before, uh, thanks for everything.
<clears throat> Some fighter you are. You've been dozing ever since we started. I want to be in good shape tomorrow morning. Our time is short. Turn off the road at that diner. We'll have coffee. I don't want you to fall asleep at the wheel. same roof to ignore each other completely. Oh, no. Then it's you again. As a patron of this so-called cafe, I have the right to take my coffee with or without television. Who's Blair? You sure those pictures were meant to be shown to the public? Times and moral standards have changed, my child. That waitress, the way she reacted to your kiss eye, I felt as if I were peeping through a keyhole. Naturally. Those pictures were designed to capitalize on the vicarious cravings of middle-aged glandular cases. Dad, 
Yes? Did you realize at the time what a bad actor you were? My child, at the time those films were made, I was recognized as one of the few real talents in Hollywood. Furthermore, I ranked second in a nationwide popularity poll. Who was first? Some stupid police dog. I've forgotten his name. But I'll have you know that my salary was three times more than his. Which were you going? Good morning. I'd like to speak to Mr. Levitt, please. I'm afraid he's not in yet. Who's calling? Thornton Sayre. And the elevator operator told me he arrived at a little after nine. What is the nature of your business? I'm here to see Mr. Levitt about Bruce Blair. What? You're Bruce Blair. Uh, kindly announce me to Mr. Levitt, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Bruce Blair to see Mr. Levitt. Mr. Levitt? Yes? There's a man outside, says he's Bruce Blair. Bruce! Bruce Blair! Come in! Bruce Blair? You know. Bruce, I've been looking for you all over. I thought you were dead. Yeah, that's my intention. You hear all this talk? It's about you. Bruce, you're hotter than a firecracker. The name is Thornton Sayre. Oh, yeah, yeah. Slip of the lip. Uh, this is my daughter, Carol. Well, Carol. <laughs> you must be pretty proud of the old man, huh, Carol? Yes, he's a great educator. Oh, right, you are. If you don't make love like Bruce Blair these days, you're a dead duck. Can't we have a little privacy? Oh, sure, sure. I got an office full of it. Come on in. <laughs> Please stop handling me in that familiar manner. <laughs> Looks great, don't he, Dorothy? I mean, when we get him fixed up a little. You can see he's Bruce Blair, all right. I mean, if you know it. <laughs> My dear lady, your rudeness is exceeded only by that of your employer. I am what I am, and I'm not submitting to any fixing up. We were only talking the way everybody always talks in show business, Bruce. I mean, Thornton, you remember. Sit down right over there, Carol. Bruce, over here, please. Huh? <laughs> you, uh, you been to New York before, Carol? No, I haven't. Ah. Uh -huh. Dorothy, send in Bill Ainsley. Nice boy, Bill. The women love him. And what could that possibly have to do with me? Well, you want to talk business, don't you? We don't want to bore your daughter over here, do we? Bill, I got some nice work for you. I want you to show Miss Blair, I mean Miss Sayre, around town. I'd be pleased to. This is entirely Mr. Levitt's idea. You know who this is, Bill? Oh, I heard outside. I'm very happy to know you, Mr. Blair. Young man, the name is Sayre. Furthermore, you don't know me, and when you do, you won't be particularly happy. Yes, sir. <laughs> Shall we go, Miss Sayre? Perhaps you'll leave me here, Dad. No, thanks, dear. I can handle this. We're staying at the Savoy Arms, young man. I should expect my daughter to be returned at a reasonable hour. Yes, sir. See you later, dear. No. Thornton, my boy, it's like you stepped right out of a grave. What did I tell you what's happened? Well, like the 20,000 fan letters I got stacked up in my filing room. Why haven't you burned them? <laughs> it's a wonder that some of them haven't burnt themselves up. You know, this is the craziest thing that's ever happened in all the years I've been in show business. The correct word is catastrophic. Thanks. Who saw fit to resurrect those old films? I did. Now, I bought the negatives for peanuts. Oh, strictly out of sentiment for you and glory, of course. And I dubbed in the music and the sound effects. Then this perfume company came along looking for a way to sell their junk on television. Don't do and that. wham! Look at these things I have on the desk. Do you realize you can have your pick as a guest on any of the live television shows for top money? I don't... The endorsements that you can collect on. Vitamins, bourbon, canned oysters, underwear. I don't... And this will really kill you. After all these years, three nibbles from Hollywood. Mr. Levitt. Apparently, you have no idea why I came here. Dreamboat! <laughs> mm, Dorothy told me about it. I couldn't believe my ears, but you look wonderful. Now, Blair, if we can just get another one. Yeah, this time with your arms around her. Uh, gentlemen, I was under the impression that I'm in a private office. Well, what's the matter, darling? This is wonderful publicity. I'm in conference with Mr. Levitt, and I insist upon privacy. Well, I'll see you later, boys. We'll, we'll straighten this thing out. Where did they come from? Good newspaper men are always where there's a good story. What do you think of our pal here, crawling out of his hole? Well, I think it's wonderful. Did you ever think this would happen to us again? <laughs> Washed up for so many years, and then all at once, poof, 
We're right back on top again. <laughs> I was telling him of all the offers waiting for him. Well, it's nothing compared to what we can do together. Of course, I've done very well on my own. But people do think of us as a team, and all of show business is open to us again. Oh, darling, thanks for coming back. Mr. Levitt, may I tell you once and for all why I am here? I have come to stop the showing of those incredible pictures which you so ghoulishly plucked from their grave. You've come to stop them? You mean after all they've done for glory and now what they can do for you, you want to stop them? The sooner the better. Where have you been all of these years? In a cage? You wouldn't understand. But I have been engaged in a profession where I actually am permitted to use my mind. I am a teacher of Latin and English literature at Underhill College. You mean you quit the big dough in Hollywood to go back to that? No wonder we couldn't find him. Who'd ever think you'd be so stupid? I told you you wouldn't understand. But at least you can appreciate that the showing of those old pictures makes it impossible for me to maintain a dignified and respected position as an educator. Oh, wait just a minute. This is my television show you're talking about. What makes you think you can stop it? A fair knowledge of my rights as a citizen and an individual. Reviving these films is a rank invasion of my privacy. You've got to think of Gloria. After all, she gave you your first break in Hollywood. How well I remember. There I was, lecturing at the University of Southern California, minding my own business, and she saw me on the campus. Before I realized what was happening, I was in full makeup, wearing a pair of silk tights and brandishing a rubber sword at a former real estate agent from Cleveland. I have thought of you often and bitterly. Why, you ungrateful worm! Mr. Levitt, either you withdraw those pictures from television or I'll secure an injunction. Just a minute, it's not as easy as all that. There's contracts I signed. I, you gotta give me time to think. Sam, I warn you, if you take those pictures off of television, I'll sue you for breach of contract and collect. You see what I mean? From all sides, I'm getting it. That's your problem. I've told you what I expect from you, and you better get busy immediately. Good day. Well, here we are. At the reasonable hour your father demanded. It was a very educational afternoon. Tell me, do you entertain out-of-town visitors often? No, almost every day. Well, doesn't it get monotonous? I mean, seeing things like the zoo and the Statue of Liberty and the Metropolitan Museum and Grant's tomb so often. You forgot the top of the Empire State Building. No, I've never seen any of them before in my life. Oh, well, where do you usually take visitors? Oh, 21, Colony, Matinee of Call Me Madam, whatever I think they'd like. So you decided I'd enjoy the places we visited today? Didn't you? What influences your decision as to how you shall entertain visitors? Oh, I don't know. First impressions, I guess. Personality, mainly. So after one look at me, you decided I was the museum type. I wouldn't put it that way. The places that we saw are the places people say you should see. I've never seen them. And the reason I've never seen them is that I've never been asked to entertain anyone who might enjoy seeing them. No matter what you say, it still comes out the same. I'm definitely the museum type. Well, all right, so you're the museum type. Mr. Ainsley, may I thank you for the most boring afternoon I've ever spent in my entire life. Good night. Carol, I was beginning to worry about you. There's no need. I'm the museum type. You're what? Where are you going? Sam Levitt has invited us to dine. He's under the delusion that he and I can come to an agreement about those pictures. From the little I know of him, all he wants is a chance to talk you out of getting that injunction. My dear girl, Levitt could talk to me until he was blue in the face, and all he'd have to show for it would be a blue face. You better touch up a little. No, thanks. I'd rather have dinner here. All right, we'll both dine here. No, you keep your date, please. I'll, I'll just have an early dinner and go right to bed. Carol, is anything wrong? No. Well, you seem upset about something. Did you have any trouble with that young upstart from the agency? Are you kidding? How could I possibly have trouble with any man?
keep the change. Thank you, Mr. Levitt. More coffee, gentlemen? Uh, no, thank you. Bring us two brandies. Your best. Yes, sir. Not too bad a dinner, eh, pal? Best I've had in years. Cigar? No, thank you. A little brandy with the coffee will mellow everything, eh? You're wasting your time, Levitt. It's not my nature to be mellow with or without brandy. You may ask me now or you may ask me later. The answer is still the same. Believe me, pal, I didn't even think of it. This is for old times' sake. You know, and the days when you and Gloria... Ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. Here she is, queen of the silent cinema, queen of television, and now queen of the nightclubs. I give you Miss Gloria Marlowe. What a shabby trick. Why didn't you tell me she was here? I brought you here because it's the best food in town. You don't have to listen to her. Come on, sit down, finish your coffee. You'll never know just how much I miss you. much, ladies and gentlemen. This is a great thrill for me, after so many years away from the spotlight. But even a greater thrill is the fact that someone is here tonight who is very dear to me. This man, the same as I, was brought back to his public through the miracle of television. There's a reason for his great popularity after so many years, and that is because he's one of the finest actors the screen has ever known. His artistry will endure as long as motion pictures are shown. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present your all-time favorite, Bruce Blair. She shouldn't have done that. Oh. 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 How sweet of you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I would like another coincidence in an evening filled with subtle touches. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Marlowe has asked the orchestra to play Avalon, a song which at one time held a particular significance for both of us. Avalon is a resort of sorts off the coast of Southern California, and I would be most happy to learn that an earthquake had sent it to the bottom of the sea. 
As a man long since returned to private life, I am not happy about being called upon to appear before you, but your reception has been most kind and, I believe, sincere. For that, I am deeply grateful. Thank you. What am I doing here? What a shabby trick you played on me. I should have stayed at my table and let you stew in your own double passion. Come inside, please. I had no idea you'd be here tonight. Nothing was planned. I, I merely said and did what was in my heart. Won't you sit down? I would like to apologize for my rudeness this afternoon. Perhaps if you knew all the circumstances, you'd understand why I blew up when I found out why you were in New York. I need this work, darling. I need it desperately. I am not interfering with this engagement. I'm merely fighting what you're doing with our pictures on television. How long do you think there'll be other engagements if these pictures are stopped? Come in. Mr. Levitt left a message. He's sorry, but he had to go to his office to take a call from London. Thank you. Dear, Sam was going to take me home. Would you? I'll drop you off. Well, that's all I meant. After all, there's no reason why we can't be friends. You wait outside and I'll be dressed in just one minute. I realize, Gloria, that what I'm going to do will hurt your professional career, but there's no other choice for me. If I don't stop your showing of our older pictures on television, all the years I've worked to maintain my standing as an educator will be wasted. I understand. It's quite a situation, isn't it? One of us must lose everything he's ever lived for. And I guess I'm it. It isn't as if I've thrown you into the street. You have money. I? I haven't a penny. But those clothes, those furs, your jewels. All rented. Rented to keep up a front. I, I don't understand. You're drawing a salary on television. The bare minimum. The real salary was to have come later. What about the nightclub? Well, to be perfectly frank with you, darling, up until a few months ago, I was almost hopelessly in debt. Now I'm paying off. Getting ready for the big breaks. stopped here because this is where I live that way this is all so depressing I had no idea oh it's all right after you get accustomed to it you may think this is silly after so many years but in memory of da -ya -da 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 -da. Good night. Good night, Gloria. Well. <laughs> Lady, you sure you got the right address? Oh, dear, there must be some mistake. Would you be kind enough to call a cab? Good evening, Miss Marlowe. Hello, Frank. There you are. Keep the change. Come in. Good morning, dear. I would have ordered breakfast for you, but I didn't know what time you'd awaken. You were out rather late. Yes. Well, what happened? Happened? Well, as I recall, you were going to tell Mr. Levitt he was wasting his time. I did. But now we can get down to business. Business? Dad, what's wrong? Don't tell me you've forgotten why we're here. No, no. Of course not. Well, what is it? What's bothering you? Dad, tell me. Uh, it's Gloria, Miss Marlowe. 
What about her? Did you see her last night? And what if I did? That vulgar woman, I suppose, did everything possible to play on your sympathies. She's not vulgar and she didn't play on my sympathies. The facts were there for me to see. Carol, come here. If I stop the showing of those pictures, her career is ruined. If you stop them? You know she's deeply in debt, hasn't got a penny to her name. And you should see where she lives. Well, what about us? Are you going to give up your job, your career as a teacher, so she can go on ridiculing you in public as Dreamboat? I don't know what to do. Well, I do. I've made an appointment for you with Mr. Harrington. D.W. Harrington, the lawyer you wanted to see, remember? Of course I remember, and if you don't mind, I'll make my own appointments. He'll see you at one o'clock. He'll see me when I'm ready to see him. And if you can't treat your father with respect, at least you can permit him to settle his own problems without interference. But all at once you're acting like a child. That woman's making a fool of you. I'll hold you to account for those remarks later, young lady. Hello. Uh, Miss Sayre, this is Bill Ainsley. Oh, it's you. I've been thinking a lot about yesterday. I'm calling to apologize. Apologize for what? I'd say everything was extremely proper. Well, I'd uh, like another chance to do right by you uh, this evening. This is your Mr. Levitt's idea, no doubt. No, no, it's entirely mine. Would you ask your dad if it'd be all right? Ask my father. You think I'm an infant? Well, he didn't seem to think very much of me, and I thought maybe if you... What he thinks of you is his affair. I'll do as I please. I'd be delighted to have dinner with you, Mr. Ainsley. Fine. I'll call for you for dinner at 7, and... and, uh, anything you'd like to do later. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ask my father. Give me the key to my room, will you, everybody? I'm telling you, you don't get the key till you pay for your room. Boo, sure, you got enough dough for booze, but when it comes to a place to flop... Announce me to Miss Marlowe, please. Now, scram. Oh, uh, yes. Who? Miss Gloria Marlowe. Aren't you familiar with your own guest list? We ain't got it, Gloria. Wait, are you talking about Gloria Marlowe, the dame on television? Crudely put, but true. <laughs> Now, what would she be doing here? Hey, that was her last night. What do you mean? The dish in the fur coat. Of course, I brought her here. She walked in, and I asked her what she was doing here, and she said, I think I made a mistake. Would you call me a cab just like that? You Eden, she actually doesn't live here. Are you kidding? Don't you read the fan magazines? That dame has saved the dough since she was 18. And she made it before taxes? Hey. Sure, Dorothy, send her right in. Come in, honey. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I had to leave you and Sarah last night. I'll bet you are. You framed me. You knew I'd do anything on earth to keep those films on television. How'd you make out? I can't be sure yet, but I have a hunch the dreamboat is going through a change of mind. Wonderful, wonderful. How'd you work it? <laughs> There's certain things a woman doesn't like to talk about. Oh. Excuse me. Yes? Mr. Sarah's here, Mr. Levitt. Tell the girl to send him right in. I don't care what you did, honey. It worked. Oh, maybe you'd better let me wait outside while you talk to you him. You stay right where you are. We three have got deals to talk over. Big deals. Come in, my boy. Come in. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I had to run out on you and Gloria. quite all right. I understand. Good morning. Good I'm, morning, darling. I'm delighted you're here. Now we can get a, everything settled at once. Fine, fine. You're a smart man, my boy. I knew you'd see the light. Yes, finally I saw the light. First... Concerning my original desire to have my motion pictures withdrawn from television... So what? Everybody goes off half-cocked sometimes? one half hour ago, I instructed my attorney to secure a restraining injunction. You're filing suit? No. Yes, my boy. Definitely, yes. But last night... Last you... night, Miss Marlowe, you gave one of the poorest performances of your entire career, which is quite an achievement. No, just... And a... yours was even worse. Do you think that for one moment I was taken in by that overripe rendition of Bertha, the sewing machine girl? Or that shabby hotel routine? 
or that bilious display of sentimentality. Now you... Oh, do da 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 Oh, no. I beg your pardon. I'll see you two charming characters in court. What a job of fixing you did. Well, something's happened to him. He wasn't like this last night. Well, Sam, you've got to stop him. He's going to ruin us. You think you're giving me information I don't know? Yes. Dorothy, get me my lawyer. You'd better get your lawyer's lawyer. Carol? Yes? Come here. What is the meaning of all this? It's your life, you living. They're from your television fans. If that's what you want to call the lecherous type of middle-aged she-wolves you seem to attract. Is that from the one who's willing to make herself available by drowning her husband? No, the one with the island. This is the most brazen display of female emotionalism I've ever seen. Hello, hello? Give me the desk clerk. He didn't have his picture in the paper with Gloria Marlowe's arm around him. You can't blame him. I'm not blaming him. Hello, desk clerk. This is Thornton Sayer. I want no further deliveries of any flowers whatsoever to my room. And furthermore, I want all the flowers already delivered to be called for immediately and sent to the nearest funeral parlor. Thank you. Sir. Did you make up your mind about Gloria Marlowe? Naturally. Did you see her again? I saw her and Mr. Levitt and Mr. Harrington, the attorney. And I informed Miss Marlowe and Mr. Levitt that as of now, I am suing for an injunction to restrain the showing of my films permanently. Oh, Dad, I'm so happy for you. For a moment this morning, I was afraid she was going to make a fool of you. That transparent faker. <laughs> you underestimate your father, my child. Now, I'll freshen up and we'll have dinner together. How about the hotel dining room? I'm sorry, Dad, but I didn't know when you'd be back. Besides, you were pretty rude when you left this morning. Meaning what? I have a dinner engagement. But with whom? The only person you've met is that impossible Bill Ainsley. I'm having dinner with that impossible Bill Ainsley. Are you out of your mind? He's not the type of man for you. I didn't say he was, Dad, but what type is for me? Well, that... Uh, That's one part of my education you've neglected completely. As a result, some people might come to the conclusion that I'm the museum type. Well, perhaps I am, but I'm going to find out for myself the way you do, Dad. What's all this gibberish about being the museum type? I'll let you know when I find out. Hello? No, this is not Dreamboat. He is not here, nor do I expect him. He sailed for, for Borneo. Why does anyone go to Borneo? To hunt heads. Hello, Bill. Oh, hi, Steve. Hi, Bill. Hello, Warren. Mr. Ainsley, I imagine you're suffering even more than I. Shall we sit down? I was enjoying it very much, but if you wish... Good night. Good night, Carolyn. Good night. Well, it's still early. Is there any other place you'd like to go? Yes. To your apartment. My apartment? You enjoyed your dinner, Mr. Blair? I enjoy nothing when I'm addressed as Mr. Blair. Tonight, the exotic perfume company is happy to present another dream... How much do you do, please? A dollar to a tax. In this epic story of the foreign legions, Bruce Blair... A dollar? ...on robe, the dashing sergeant, in love with a cabaret girl... One. ...played by... Two. Yes, with two. tax. Thank you. What would be, sir? Uh, Dubonnet.
You mean what I am? Watch your tongue, sir. What'd you say, bud? Nothing. Nothing at all? Is your room satisfactory, Dr. Coffey? Uh, yes, thank you. Could you tell me where I might find Mr. Sayer? Ace, thanks. I beg your pardon. Beg my pardon? What did you do? Every time I come home from work, I should slobber over you like that drip. Hmm. Look at him. I could lick that drink of water with both hands tied to my feet. You think so? Well, let me tell you that when I finished with that brute, he wound up in the hospital. Hey, it's Dreamboat in the flesh! The other guy that's been messing up my life. Why, I ought to punch your teeth down your throat. Herman, you promised! I promised nothing. Oh. Um. This is it. It's nice. May I have a drink, please? A drink? Well, is that an unusual request from a lady? Well, from you, yes. But what's happened to you? Why did you want to come here? Well, you've brought women here before, haven't you? Oh, yes, but I... I'd like that drink, please. in here. Yes. I've been looking at your trophies. I guess it's always warm in here. Well, I barely know those women. Telegraph pictures are a dime a dozen in show business. Well, now that we're here, what are you going to do about me? Do? Well, I do. 
You guessed I was a museum type. Let's find out. Liked it very much. So did I. You know, that's the first time I've ever been kissed. What's the matter? Nothing. I'd better take you back to the hotel. I have to find out something. Am I the museum type? This isn't a research laboratory, kid. I'm taking you back to your father. Well, now you're calling me a child. Doesn't that's overdoing it a bit? Look, you're a very nice young lady, and I'm trying to be a gentleman. Now slip into your coat. Don't look at me. It says, slip into your coat. Why? I don't trust my own willpower. You still haven't told me. Am I the museum type? If you are, I've been spending an awful lot of time in the wrong places. That detective had dared to arrest me, I'd have taken the case to the highest court. He had no choice. Even the man's wife said it was her husband's fault. The woman seemed quite infatuated with you. Not with me, with that idiotic character, Bruce Blair. What brings you to New York? Bruce Blair, come in. I must talk to you. Why, this room is right next to mine. Yes, a coincidence. Step inside, please. Why did you say Bruce Blair brought you here? The Board of Trustees at Underhill is getting restless. They want you discharged immediately. But why? I'm doing what I came here to do. I've already filed a petition for an injunction restraining the showing of my films. It's the publicity you've been receiving, Thornton. Particularly that picture showing you embracing <laughs> Gloria Marlowe when you arrived in New York. The Board is beginning to feel that as far as you're concerned, you still are Bruce Blair. But this is ridiculous. I'm devoting every waking hour to consigning Bruce Blair to oblivion. I've been sent here to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with you, Thornton. I'm to find out if you really wish to return to your job as Thornton Sayre, the teacher. Of course I do. Then what primitive emotion prompted you to enter a barroom tonight and become involved in a brawl over a woman? You're distorting the facts. No, Thornton. Despite the fact that I am representing the Board of Trustees, I am here to help you. No matter what you tell me, I'm going to recommend that you not be discharged. Thank you, Doctor. But... In return for that favor, I want the truth from you. I want you to confess to me that despite every valiant effort on your part, you cannot destroy the fact that basically you are Bruce Blair. I want you to admit that the pose as Thornton Sayre is a screen behind which hides the real man that is you. This will be our secret, and no one else shall ever know. <laughs> what you're saying is fantastic. You're trying to put an utterly false confession into my mouth. No, you listen to me. Bruce. I'm, uh, <laughs> my me. name isn't Bruce, and I can take only so much of this tummy rot. I know, and then the real you comes Will through. you forget this nonsense and listen? Oh, don't touch me, you... you beast. Good night, Doctor. I'll talk to you when you're not so tired. Now what? Stay where you are. Don't come one step nearer. But I have moved. And it was you who followed me in I here. I have to find out the truth about you, no matter what may happen to me. Oh, poor man. You try so hard to live a decent, honorable life, don't you? And then this something inside you breaks loose, and you become a man without conscience or scruples. A man in search of a woman. <laughs> and when this happens to you, nothing else in the world matters. Only this great burning desire, this torturous craving for love. That's the real you, isn't it, Bruce? Tell me, darling. You have to tell me. Uh, doctor, believe me, believe me, you are in no condition to discuss anything now. Uh, you've had a long trip, you, you, you're, you're worn out. Uh, no, Doctor, no! A thousand times no! I'll take you to your room. Sit down there! Um. Thanks for everything. It's been a wonderful evening. It was more than that. It was a revelation. Oh, hello, Carol. Evening, Bill. Well, I'd better say good night. Night. <clears throat> uh, 
Carol. I, I don't know what came over Dr. Coffey. She fought me like a mad woman. Maybe you rushed things. Uh, rushed things? Are you insinuating that I was making advances to that neurotic spinster? <laughs> Never mind, Dad. I understand. What? Now. I guess there's nothing we can do about it, Dad. It's in our blood. Good night. Dreamboat. Proceed, Mr. Harrington. Your Honor, it is our intent to prove that there should be granted a permanent injunction against the showing of my client's motion pictures on television. Consider this man's plight, Your Honor. Here you see a man who has not performed in a motion picture for many years. A man who left Hollywood at the height of his career to devote his life to the honorable and dignified profession of teaching. And now, suddenly, this man's privacy is invaded by merciless commercial interests who are wantonly destroying his teaching career by reviving his old motion pictures on television and identifying him as Dreamboat. <laughs> Give this man the right to live the lawful and commendable life of his own choosing, Your Honor. We ask that you return to him one of the most priceless possessions of every American citizen, his rights of privacy. Thank you, Your Honor. You overdid it. I'm not an unwed mother lost in a snowstorm. Is counsel for the respondent ready? Well, if it pleases Your Honor, I shall dispense with the theatrical emotionalism displayed by counsel for the petitioner and recite plain facts. Number one is that Thornton Sayre as Bruce Blair appeared in a series of motion pictures of his own free will and was paid for those appearances. Number two is that these pictures were made to be shown to the public and Mr. Sayre was well aware of that fact. Number three, the medium of television in showing these motion pictures to the public conforms exactly to the purpose for which they were made. What strange thinking moves the petitioner to claim an invasion of his rights of privacy when he performed in these pictures for public exhibition. And beyond that, doesn't he know that motion pictures are the bread and butter of television today and that a selfish restraint against their showing would endanger the jobs of thousands of honest, loyal Americans now employed by the television industry? Is this uh, what you call dispensing with theatrical emotionalism? Well, I... I submit, Your Honor, that these are facts. And in conclusion, I offer for your consideration the paradox of a self-professed educator seeking to destroy the greatest educational medium in the world today, television. Your Honor, I resent this windbag's contention that I am seeking to destroy television. Mr. Sayre, you are represented by counsel and are not to speak for yourself at random. I order you to observe proper court procedure. But, Your Honor, uh, Does uh, counsel for the petitioner understand that he's been asked to call his first uh, witness? Your Honor, my client has asked that this television set, which we offer as petitioner's exhibit A, be his first witness. How can a television set be a witness? May I be permitted to speak, Your Honor? Why have you engaged counsel if you don't use him? Go ahead. Your Honor, I contend that anyone or anything that can speak with authority in my behalf is my witness. Objection, Your Honor! Objection! This is not a witness, it's merely an exhibit. I submit that the petitioner is out of order. Unfortunately, I have no precedent in law to guide me, but obviously the thing can speak, therefore I accept it. Objection overruled. Let's examine it. Your Honor, the counsel for the respondent has criticized me for not wanting to be exploited on what he calls the greatest educational medium 
in the world today. I ask my witness to speak for itself. Now, folks, I'm not hinting to you that Crazy Sam is the squarest shooting used car dealer in the world today. I'm telling you, when you come to Crazy Sam, you're coming to a friend, a man who will give you twice what your old beat-up jalopy is worth and sell you unbelievable bargains like these for half of what they're worth. All you gotta do is to open your heart to Crazy Sam, tell him what you got in the bank, and he'll find a car for you that'll give you double value right down to your very last dollar. Brother, you'll get the surprise of your life. <laughs> and that is what the respondents hope may someday replace the public school system. That's all, Your Honor. <laughs> Does counsel for the respondent wish to cross-examine the witness? No question, Your Honor. But we must protest that to prejudice the court, the petitioner has deliberately selected a program which would indicate a low standard of quality for television, and we charge that that selection was premeditated. Would the court care to select a channel? Any channel? Six. Six. Now, here is what happens when you use an ordinary hair tonic. The ordinary hair tonic, having no penetrating power whatsoever, rolls down the hair and lies helplessly on your scalp until it evaporates. Leaving dry, scaly, irritating particles on the skin. Now, watch Penetroleum in action. Penetroleum, the hair tonic with the three magic ingredients. First, Penetroleum's magic electrofibro ingredient which instantly brings each dull and drooping hair to life. Next, Penetroleum's magic penetrating agent, Cosmotron, bores its way to the food sack at the base of each hair. And finally, Penetroleum's magic Vita Life ingredient, which nourishes the hair back to brilliant, lustrous strength. That's Penetroleum in action. Petroleum will make you also kissable. Women everywhere will find you irresistible. Ravishing, embraceable, dangerous and such. With a head they love to touch. Woo! P-E-N-E-T. Your Honor, I submit that the petitioner is seeking to evade a specific issue by showing programs which are entirely foreign to the one under discussion. I would like to answer that charge, Your Honor, by questioning Miss Marlowe. Call a witness. Miss Marlowe. Must I remind you again that you've engaged counsel to speak for you? Let him question the witness. But he doesn't know what to ask. Permission granted. For the last time. Thank you, Your Honor. Miss Marlowe. You said that no attempt was made to have me appear ridiculous in your presentation of our old pictures. That is correct. Yet despite the actual plot content of these pictures, don't you indicate in your commercials that if you hadn't doused yourself with exotic perfume company's double passion, I would never have fallen in love with you? In the pictures, I mean. That is a small liberty we take in television commercials. It doesn't harm you. It doesn't harm me to state that the moment a woman steeps herself in some foul odor, I am at her mercy. Your Honor, I ask you. Don't ask me anything until I know what you're talking about. I ask that counsel for the respondent make available to this court immediately a kinescope sample of the television program under discussion. For projection in the courtroom, Your Honor? Yes. Your Honor, may I select the program? Yes, Your Honor. In order not to bore Your Honor, I have selected the last few hundred feet of what is intended to be the next television program for exotic perfumes. Never mind the lecture, start the picture. Yes, Your Honor. Close the blinds, please.
What happened? I stopped the film, Your Honor, to explain what is about to happen. I've told you until I'm blue in the face, such explanations must be made by your counsel. But this is a technical point of which my attorney is totally ignorant. Your Honor, I object to the statement of my client that I'm... My client? What you have seen up to now, Your Honor, is a motion picture as it was originally filmed. What you will see next is a continuation of the same picture, deliberately altered for television, thereby turning me into the world's foremost nincompoop. Proceed. <laughs> Is that you? Yes, Dad. I missed you in court today. Well, I read about it in the papers. Congratulations. It was quite a victory, if I do say so. But I believed in what I was fighting for. That's why I won. What actually were you fighting for, Dad? Why, you know as well as I. You encouraged me all the way. Even gave me a good old-fashioned pep talk when you thought I was weakening. You know why I acted that way? Because you brought me up with a half-baked idea about life and what it's all about. I was blind. It's your fault. Carol, I don't understand you. And I can't understand you. You're a very talented man, Dad, the idol of millions of people. And yet you say all you want to do is to go back to Underhill College where you're completely unappreciated and try to pound knowledge into the heads of students who live only for holidays. You know what they call you at Underhill behind your back? I don't care what they call me, but I'm amazed at your attitude. Carol, what's happened to you since we came to New York? these clothes and your constant dates with Bill. I found out a little about living, Dad, and I like it. I like it very much. That's something you've kept from me. Tell me, are you infatuated with this... this adolescent theatrical character? Bill's a man. All man. Hmm. Uh, well, you'll forget him as soon as we get back to Underhill. You better start packing right away. We're leaving tonight. I'm not going back, Dad. Bill asked me to marry him. Are you out of your mind? He's not the kind of person for you. I think he is. But you're a brilliant young woman with a wonderful career ahead of you as a teacher. Well, what's that got to do with marriage? Does every female teacher have to be like Dr. Coffee? Carol, I say that you're coming back to Underhill with me tonight. And I say I'm not. You've kept me cooped up there all my life while you posed as a teacher and hid from an outside world that you just didn't happen to like. Well, I like it and I'm staying in it. Where are you going? Back to Bill. I forbid it. Dad, you forget. Despite how much you try to prevent it, I'm of age now. Carol, if you marry Bill Ainsley, I'll have nothing further to do with you as a father. That's the way it should be when a girl gets a man of her own. I wish we had your blessing. But you're acting just as the kids back at Underhill would expect from old Ironheart. Old Ironheart? Yes? Dr. Coffey. Don't worry, I'll not make a fool of myself again. Sit down, Doctor. You're leaving? Yes, I'm going back to Underhill tonight. Without consulting me? But I've done what I promised the board to do. My picture's off television for good. But I have not made my decision yet. And the board has entrusted this matter to me. Aren't you satisfied with what I've done? This situation has become very embarrassing to me, Thornton. You're well aware that I love you very much. I appreciate your feelings, Doctor. No, you don't. 
You have no idea what it means to a woman to be hopelessly in love, a woman scorned. I couldn't bear to have you return to Underhill, associating with me and yet despising me. But I don't despise you. I'm really very fond of you. Would you be willing to prove that now? Now? Now. <laughs> no, Doctor. No. You mouse! You're fired! Oh, it's you. Yes. I came to have one last good look at the idiot who wrecked his own life just for the satisfaction of ruining mine. This is the most incredible performance in your pitiful repertoire. You are entirely responsible for every miserable thing that has happened to both of us. The order is? Nothing, thank you. Are you ungrateful, untalented hypocrite? You've never been anything without me. What were you when I found you on that California campus? A third-rate professor with a fourth-rate future. Discovered by a fifth-rate actress with a mentality that defies classification. And what were you when I co-starred you in my pictures? An obscure ham riding on my ability, and you knew it. That's why you quit Hollywood before you were thrown out. Uh, there's one little mistake, my dear. I quit Hollywood before you were thrown out. And why do you think you were so popular in those films on television? Because I made you a star again. By deceiving all of those nice little women into believing that you were the greatest lover since Casanova. Oh, <laughs> what a laugh. You've got a heart as cold as a frozen halibut. And you couldn't act your way out of a wet paper bag. Apparently, my tired Juliet, your opinion of my acting ability is not shared by Hollywood. I have here a contract awaiting my signature, the terms of which would turn your green eyes red with envy. I notice it contains no mention of you whatsoever. What? You making pictures in Hollywood today? Why not? Hollywood learned to talk after you left. There's an increasing demand for people with something to say. Well, this is fantastic. Well, you'll be the biggest flop in the history of show business. We'll see. Yes, indeed we will. But whatever happens will be a pleasure, because it will happen without interference from you. Good evening. Or more important, goodbye. Again. <laughs> you will remain seated. Now eat your breakfast and chew each mouthful 28 times. Not 20, mind you, or 26, but 28 times. <laughs> Mrs. King, throughout this grisly meal, your son has been pelting me with cereal. I have taught him an object lesson. Dad, you're wonderful. Thank you, my dear. And you, Miss Muller, any comment? Oh, I think you're terrific. You've changed your opinion considerably, haven't you? We're going to do wonderful things together, Thornton. We? Yes, I bought your contract from Sam Levitt. <laughs> <laughs> 